team is KP Fabian, and it is uh, my pleasure and privilege alike to welcome you to our webinar on behalf of the India International Center in Delhi, where there is a bright, sunny afternoon and the temperature is very, very comfortable. So, we are going to discuss uh, Ukraine, the crisis uh, in and over Ukraine. The title is carefully chosen because it is not exactly correct to say that, you know, the crisis arises because of Russian invasion. Well, that is a very important factor. Also, we should take note of the fact that uh, President Putin, for whatever reasons, he has uh, used this, an expression, special military <clears throat> operation. He doesn't want to say invasion. And, remote, so good, yeah. and uh, remote, in yeah. fact, if you are in Russia and if you use that uh, expression, invasion, then you might get into trouble. Now, we have a very distinguished panel to tell us what is happening, why is this crisis there, and uh, what might be, you know, the future, immediate future of this uh, unfolding and unscripted tragedy. We have uh, Ambassador Mira Shankar, we have uh, Dr. John Cherian, and we have uh, Professor Anuradha Shinoi. None of them needs uh, any introduction to this uh, audience. Uh, this is the 10th day. Over a million uh, human beings have fled Ukraine. According to the United Nations, uh, if this continues, 10 million Ukrainians out of a population of 43 million will be displaced with uh, six of them displaced within and 4 million outside. As you would have noticed, NATO has declined the request from President Zelensky to have a no-fly zone. He is now going to address the Senate, U.S. Senate, sometime later. We have our students there, and uh, India stand at the Security Council and at the General Assembly has uh, evoked uh, much uh, debate. Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished speakers uh, have told me that they would speak for about 12 minutes. The idea is to give uh, as much time as possible for Q&A. On your screen, you, I hope you can see Q&A. If you click there, then you'll be able to write down your, uh, your questions. And if you like, uh, you may address it to a particular uh, speaker. Now, I'm going to request uh, uh, Professor Anuradha <clears throat> Shinoi to speak first. As I said, you know, she is uh, uh, she's familiar to us. Uh, she was the dean uh, at the School of International Studies at JNU. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Anuradha, I wanted to request you to I mean, you may tell us whatever you may like to tell us, but uh, if you could also keep uh, tell us about uh, the origins of this uh, crisis uh, and uh, so far what has happened, uh, how are the powers aligned, what are the interests at play, and also on India's stand and its implications. Over to you, Professor Anuradha. Uh uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Fabian, uh, Neera Shankar, John, uh, friends at the India International Center, and uh, friends uh, who have registered. Um, of course, I think the first question that comes to mind is that why does this war go on 
and uh, why this war goes on are really also the reasons why this war started. And I'm going to be brief because I have several points uh, in very various sections. Now, of course, this war goes on because each of the party to the war has a conflicting rationality, interest, and narrative that is similar to a death-like grip against each other. Uh, and before that, I want to say that I and all of us here are very opposed to the acts of war. We condemn, at least I condemn this uh, aggression. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, like the aggressions earlier in Iraq, uh, Syria, Libya, Vietnam, this is a war crime. And I ask for a ceasefire. But nonetheless, I'm going to try and explain these conflicting rationalities, interests, and narratives between the parties. First, Russia sees the expansion of NATO into Ukraine and their attempt to get uh, Ukraine to NATO as an existential threat. Because if there are NATO missiles in Ukraine, five minutes from the uh, striking distance from Russia, all major cities of Russia can be destroyed. Given the trend and narrative around NATO's 20-year expansion, where since 1990, when Russian Federation became independent, and 14 former uh, Soviet bloc countries have joined it, uh, Russians do not have the confidence uh, in either NATO or the West, because they have been arguing that NATO should not expand into the West. And there have been a large number of uh, reasons they've given, appeals they've made, attempts they've made to have some kind of working relationship with NATO, but all these have failed. So this is a 20-year-old issue at least. Second, the issue of Russian ethnic minorities and their secession from Ukraine. There have been civil wars over there. We can debate on, on what was the reason, but nonetheless, for Russia, this is an emotional issue as well as a geostrategic one, since uh, this secession will actually give Russia an additional buffer from the West. Uh, so therefore, I think Russia will not retreat till they get these two demands. And the peace treaty, if there is, I hope there is, between Russia and Ukraine will have these aspects. One, on Ukraine's neutrality. After all, you know, Austria and Finland are neutral within um, Europe. Uh, they're not part of NATO, though they have alliances with it. And second, autonomy and security for the breakaway republics. And of course, I think Russia would have to also guarantee Ukraine's future security and rebuilding. The second narrative and conflicting interest, of course, is Ukraine as uh, the party within uh, who has been attacked. Just a few years ago, it was an ally of uh, Russia, but now they believe, their leadership believes for sure, that they can get security only from NATO, uh, from the Russian threat, and they're determined to join NATO even though it means a complete destruction of their country. And they believe the EU will save them. Uh, but rebuilding Ukraine is going to involve many sides. Third, the US, also party to the conflict, you know, from whichever side you want to see it, from the background, but with Ukraine. The US has a clear agenda to retain its hegemony in Europe and globally. So they retain and have hardened their position of keeping Ukraine engaged in this war, uh, trying to invite uh, Ukraine into NATO, though at the moment they're not talking about it right now, the last uh, one month, sending weapons and security contractors into NATO every day, huge amounts of weapons, and building a narrative centered on uh, Russia and Putin with barely any mention of NATO's role. The fourth party in this conflict is Europe and its embedded security dilemmas of NATO partnership, its historical experiences and current necessities. Where again, though they try to have some amount, some of the countries like Germany and France try to have some amount of uh, strategic autonomy, they are again back into uh, accepting 
uh, NATO uh, leadership. So who, my second question is who benefits and loses in this war? First, of course, Ukraine is the biggest loser. Its economy and infrastructure is destroyed, <clears throat> it's flooded with weapons. It will be aid dependent for decades and its only gain is its collective nationalism and international sympathy. Second, Russia will gain temporarily by showing its military prowess and showing that it's willing to go to any extent to safeguard its core interests. But with the uh, sanctions and uh, the resources, this will, it will gradually weaken in the years to come. The Russians have become international pariahs and Western soft power will continue to demonize uh, the Russian regime and the Russian state and even the Russian people, uh, even though uh, there are dissenting voices and within Russia also authoritarianism will go, grow for at least a, for a while. Third, EU and several countries like Germany and France that are emerging as autonomous have had to recalibrate their positions as the US is back in Europe with their security group and they are confronted with a refu refugee and a humanitarian crisis, and they would have to uh, help in rebuilding. Of course, the sanctions on Russia will also impact them seriously, even though currently there are no sanctions on oil and gas. Fourth, the US, I believe, has everything to gain. Why? One, their role as hegemonic superpower and the credibility that was damaged on account of the kind of uh, you know, defeat and exit from Afghanistan they have tried to reestablish. Two, NATO is emerging as the only leading exclusive military alliance and the US dream of extending its power to over land, sea, space and technology is stepping up. Three, they control the security narrative in Europe and in multilateral organizations. And most countries cannot challenge their soft power or their internal democratic model. Four, their military, industry com military industrial complex is thriving and in increase its manufacturing and export capacity as sanctions on Russia grow. Fifth, their security contractors will rebuild Ukrainian in a new militarized economy. And sixth, their only worry is the Indo-Pacific. And friends, I want you to think about this. Where the geostrategic competition will grow and this will be their main target area next because for the US now, Europe is one, West Asia is demolished and outsourced, and now their interest will be in the Indo-Pacific. And that is where all of us have to watch out and plan. Of course, the biggest loss is that of fees, of the climate, environment, social justice, equity, development, and this new kind of nuclearization and the, and the threats to the planet. So my next point is the position of the global South and India. Now in the UN uh, Security Council and in the General Assembly, you would have seen, and personally, I believe uh, India's position was correct, that 40 odd countries, they condemned the Russian aggression, but they abstained or voted against these UN resolutions. These countries included the BRICS partners, you know, that's China, um, India, um, South Africa, Brazil, 18 African countries, all of the other South Asian countries, Central Asian countries, Vietnam, uh, et cetera, uh, voted, uh, abstained in the voting. Now, what was the reason for that? One, of course, their national interests. Second, None of these countries see Russia as a main threat. Three, they believe that Russia's security interests also need to be accommodated in some creative way because no country can tolerate deep isolation and targeted missiles and an ever-growing military alliance like NATO on their borders. How would US, for example, and the countries have said this, maybe not their spokespersons, but within them, how would US like this kind of military alliance on the Canadian border, for example? How did they react when it came to Cuba? And therefore they believe that this for two decades, which Russia has been arguing, appealing, talks, concessions have all fallen on deaf Western years. Fourth, they believe that they have witnessed that the US was not interested in a diplomatic solution. 
It has an agenda of retaining its hegemony in Europe. It provoked Russia, it took advantage of Ukraine's internal anxieties, and the US rejected diplomatic proposals of Ukraine as a neutral zone. Five, the countries of the global south, all of them, and the countries which, uh, you know, even those who voted for the UN resolutions, I would say the global south is one in this. They have their minds and have subtly called out US and NATO aggressions in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Yemen, Afghanistan, just in the last 20 years. Just like they've called out the contradictions and double standards on moral grounds, where the West has used the principle strategic interests, for example, the question of Palestine sanctions, where uh, which by NATO countries for years. So these are some of the reasons which India has also uh, spoken of. But for India and this war and their relations with Russia, and I'll conclude very quickly now, for India, this is a direct confrontation with between a historically time-tested strategic partner and a new strategic but dangerous ally, that is the USA, which India needs as its for its strategic interests for its northern neighbors. So therefore, they cannot take sides in this purely Western wars. They have no stakes in this war and they should not. They should only call from outside for peace and be a uh, second. India's bends, hydrocarbons and trade relations with Russia cannot be jeopardized. Third, in an unsettled, non-normative, multipolar world of which India sees itself as one of the architects, there are many new uncertainties and India has to tread this tightrope. Fourth, there will be pressures from the US on India and attempts to um, get it on its sides, especially in the Indo-Pacific, but so far, I would say India has played uh, in leverage well, and it should continue to do so. Of course, India will ensure, should ensure there's an equality in this partnership, as it cannot be uh, at the cost of its partnership with Russia or the global south. And I think India has managed this the last uh, 70 years, and I think they have the capacity to do so. Of course, India is worried about the games in the Indo-Pacific, where it's concerned about China which has uh, the uh, backing of others, it would be dragged into wars even in the Indo-Pacific. Lastly, and I conclude here, is that I believe India and the Global South have a role to play as neutral, non-aligned, strategically autonomous parties. They should call for a common security, which is equal and inclusive, no double standards in positions in the international system, call for a more democratic UN Security Council and other norms based on an equitable world order. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Anuradha, for that uh, fairly comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, you have uh, very correctly said, you know, that uh, Russia is worried about having missiles deployed so close to its borders. That is the essence of it. You also both, uh, touched upon, you know, India's uh, position and uh, its implications and all that. There will be many questions, but uh, now let us move on to the next uh, distinguished speaker, and that is uh, Ambassador Mira Shankar. She was our ambassador to the United States. Now, Ambassador Mira Shankar, the U.S. position in this matter is crucial. Now, what exactly does Biden want to do? Because, uh, you know, it has been said uh, that to understand what is happening in 2022, one should go back to 1962 when missiles, Soviet missiles are kept uh, in Cuba. Well, uh, Kennedy correctly objected. He said, you can't have missiles too close to me. But Kennedy and Khrushchev had the wisdom to negotiate 
their way out of the crisis. In fact, uh, Khrushchev agreed to remove the missiles from uh, Cuba without a written undertaking from Kennedy to remove the missiles from Turkey. When Kennedy said that uh, it would be slightly embarrassing for him to put it in writing, Khrushchev said, okay, we take your word for it. So look at the way the two men treated each other. And how do you compare that with the way Biden and Putin have been, you know, dealing with each other? And uh, today, um, Zelensky is uh, addressing the Senate. Mm -hmm. And some senators believe that America should take a tougher line. And there is some speculation about uh, oil exports from Russia and all that. Do you think there is any possibility of that? Well, um, thank you, uh, Doc, uh, Ambassador Fabian, Dr. Anuradha Chinoy, Dr. John Cherian. Um, I will uh, briefly touch upon uh, what the US position is. And clearly it's, um, I would say, strategically short-sighted. Because um, at this stage, if you look at the US's definition, its own definition of its major strategic competitor, they have identified China as the number one global challenger. And focusing on Russia, I think they're fighting the war of the last century. You know, it's a repeat of the Cold War. Uh, there have been some issues within the Democratic Party over Russia's uh, alleged interference in US politics and uh, the belief that it was this which led to President Trump's victory. So some animus that the Democratic Party has against uh, President Putin. Uh, but Biden started off on a relatively good note. Uh, the, he held the summit with President Putin and um, the effort was to try to stabilize the relationship. Um, the possibility of, um, you know, shifting uh, the Russian position a little in the triangular balance with China was something which could have animated US policy at this time, uh, like Nixon's opening up to China, which uh, decisively swung the triangular strategic relationship in the US's favor vis-a-vis -vis the then Soviet Union. Uh, but uh, the US, the new, new administration had more modest goals, but even these were good, you know, to reduce tensions, try to stabilize the relationship with Russia. And there were positive feedback after the first summit. But then you have this constant needling also over Ukraine. And some of the personalities actually who are dealing with policy in the State Department are the same ones who were there in 2014 when the Orange Revolution occurred. And therefore, you know, the tendency is always to replay the same tune or the same film and uh, not look at it afresh. Um, if you look at Ukraine, uh, they, uh, you know, the US and NATO basically said that Ukraine the path to membership could be considered in the summit in 2008. And then after that, in uh, 2014, you had the Orange Revolution, the overthrow of Yanukovych. And subsequently, in 2018, the uh, Ukrainians adopted a constitution, amended their constitution to put membership of NATO and alliance with the West as a key goal of their foreign policy. And again, in um, June 21, you see that uh, at the Brussels summit, 
the uh, possibility of Ukrainian membership of uh, NATO was again raised. Thereafter, there were joint naval exercises by NATO and Ukraine in the Black Sea. And then you had the massing of Russian troops around Ukraine, and the situation has just deteriorated very sharply since, with uh, neither side, uh, you know, neither Putin showing the willingness to reduce pressure, nor Biden or the Europeans showing the willingness to accommodate Russia's legitimate security concerns. So we've ended up in this situation. Um, yes, the Americans have uh, believed that uh, the uh, security uh, setup in Europe uh, is predicated on Russian weakness following the collapse of the Soviet Union. And their policy has been one of, uh, you know, cornering Russia rather than accommodating its legitimate security interests. You mentioned Ambassador Fabian, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the agreement to withdraw uh, missiles, uh, Russian uh, Soviet missiles from Cuba, and the missiles, uh, American missiles from Turkey, which was done clandestinely, but it was part of the bargain. And uh, then you've had a number of treaties, but in recent years, these treaties have been given the go by. You had the anti-ballistic missile treaty, which ensured that neither side would acquire ballistic missile defense systems, as these were seen as destabilizing to the nuclear deterrent with the possibility of providing a first strike capability. So it was eschewed by both sides. Now, America unilaterally walked out of the ABM treaty as their ballistic missile defense systems began to develop. Then you had the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, uh, which was concluded by Reagan and Gorbachev, which actually abolished or, uh, an, or eliminated an entire category of missiles for the first time. So all medium range missiles deployed in Europe were eliminated. The SS 18s of the Soviet Union and the Pershing 2s of the US were eliminated under this accord and President Trump walked out of it again unilaterally. He uh, also again walked out of start, though the Biden administration signaled that they were willing to discuss, uh, resume discussions on um, uh, a successor treaty to start and they extended the validity of start. Uh, the um, deployment of missiles in Europe continued to destabilize the situation because missiles were placed in Poland and in Romania, which Russia saw as being very close to its uh, borders. And uh, again, the uh, you know, uh, invalidation of the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, was seen as again opening up the possibility of deploying missiles with very short uh, warning times threatening uh, Russia's security. So you have a situation where there's one side which feels that its legitimate security interests have been consistently ignored because it has been perceived as weak. And it sees the answer to that as being the use of force to establish that it will not let itself be toyed with. Uh, again, that may not necessarily be the smartest or wisest way to go about uh, achieving uh, you know, what you consider to be crucial to your interests, but that is how Russia has responded to each of these crises. You see, after 2008, and the offer of uh, membership to Georgia and Ukraine. First, Russia intervened in Georgia, and those two enclaves are still held by them in Georgia. And then uh, in 2014, they intervened in um, Ukraine uh, to annex Crimea, where their Black Sea fleet is. And 
which has a population which is 60% almost of Russian origin. Uh, this time, I think Putin has launched a much wider invasion into Ukraine. Uh, I agree with Dr. Chinoy that, uh, you know, the biggest loser in this whole process is going to be Ukraine because by taking positions which they could not sustain on the ground, uh, they have actually endangered the lives of their citizens and put the future of their country at risk. Uh, on the other hand, Russia will also feel the pain in the long run. Right now, uh, we don't know where it will um, you know, feel that its objectives are fulfilled, but you, I do foresee that there is going to be uh, both uh, continued use of military force and continued resistance from the Ukrainian side, leading to a very chaotic and destructive situation in Ukraine. And in the long run, even if Russia succeeds here or succeeds in annexing or separating parts of Eastern Ukraine or putting a regime of their choice in Ukraine, uh, in this day and age, actually trying to govern a country, even by proxy, uh, in the face of hostility by the population of a significant segment of that country, I think is unsustainable in the long run. Uh, the economic sanctions which the West have put on Russia, which include you know, sanctions on individuals, including oligarchs, deemed to be close to Putin, uh, members of the Russian parliament who voted in favor of authorizing Putin to recognize those two breakaway republics and uh, the uh, you know, central bank uh, with whose reserves have been frozen. The ones which are there in Western banks have been frozen. Uh, similarly, seven Russian banks have been cut off from the SWIFT system uh, for exchange of information amongst banks on uh, economic and trade transactions. And of course, most important, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which would have brought energy from Russia to Germany uh, under the North Sea, bypassing Ukraine, has been put on hold. So, at, and this is something on which the US has expressed grave concerns in the past and also sought to sanction in the past. But this time round, uh, the Germans have put the clearance for this pipeline on hold and the uh, US has imposed sanctions on the North Sea, uh, North Stream pipeline uh, company itself. So pretty uh, harsh sanctions have been invoked. And while Russia may be in a better position today than 2014 because of their $600 billion worth of reserves, many in gold and quite a bit in yuan, but still quite a bit in Western currency, which has been frozen. Uh, and the other, I think, expectation that Russia had was uh, that China will perhaps help them to uh, get around the sanctions. But I think that's been a misreading of China because China's economic links with the West are far deeper, wider, and denser. And China will not put those links in jeopardy. It will collaborate with Russia to the extent that it is able to safeguard its interests in the West. So in the long run, this will end up weakening Russia. The West hopes that this will weaken Putin's leadership because just as Putin seeks a change in the leadership of uh, President Zelensky, I think the West hopes somehow by putting pressure uh, on the Russian economy and on the Russian elite 
which has got used to a very lavish lifestyle in the most luxurious uh, parts of the West, uh, that this will trigger uh, pressure on Putin, weaken him, or perhaps even trigger pressure for a change in leadership. Now, again, to me, that appears far-fetched. And it is Germany, I think, their finance minister in a recent uh, debate in their parliament who said that this is not realistic uh, to think that Putin's leadership can be changed right now. Um, in the long run, of course, we don't know. Uh, but I think the only positive that has been there so far is that Russia and Ukraine are talking and that they have agreed to uh, create a humanitarian corridor for providing safe passage to those who are trapped in the conflict. Now that's important for India if that can be put in place because we still have students in Kharkiv and Somi who are trapped there and are unable to get out. Uh, for India, of course, this is a very difficult uh, situation because we have a traditional strategic partnership with Russia and they are still a major arms supplier with 60% of our defense equipment coming from, still coming from Russia or of Russian origin. Uh, though the US, Israel and France have emerged as new partners, this diversification process is going to take time. And also India does not want to be reliant on any one group of countries alone. As we were in the past with the Soviet Union, we would like to have multiple choices. Uh, clearly the price of oil, the price of commodities is going to impact us economically because it's touched $115 a barrel. Uh, we are already feeling the pressure of inflation and uh, commodities, you know, wheat, edible oils, because Ukraine was a major exporter of edible oils that is going to be hit, uh, computer chips, because uh, again, uh, quite a few of the raw materials which go into making the chips come from either Russia or Ukraine. So this chip shortage, which is uh, impacting the whole world could uh, perhaps get aggravated. In terms of additional sanctions which the US is considering, I don't know if Europe will agree to additional sanctions on energy supplies because they are dependent on Russia for energy and switching to alternative sources will A, uh, be cumbersome and difficult at this time and also raise the cost of energy for Europe, impacting their economies at a time when they are just coming out of the you know, crisis caused by the COVID pandemic. So I am not sure that uh, you know, energy would be uh, an area to target, but uh, the long run, in the long run, the US will try to push West Europe into diversification of energy supplies. I think they are more likely to expand the list of banks and maybe the list of individuals against whom they will impose sanctions. So that is where we are. It's um, a sad day for the world. I think Europe was complacent that uh, you know war is not going to erupt within European borders. There can be proxy wars in developing countries. But today we've seen that as a result of misperceptions or misheard uh, 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 you know, narratives from both sides, because uh, the West turned a deaf ear to what Russia was saying, and Russia felt that the only way to make themselves heard or to, to ensure their interests is through the use of force. We have ended up in a situation where you could really see a, a country and a people destroyed. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ambassador Mirashenka, for that uh, in-depth uh, presentation. Uh, 
you started by saying that uh, the United States is being strategically short-sighted. That really summed it up. And then you argued the case convincingly. Uh, you also said that, you know, U.S. is sort of uh, confronting both China and Russia at the same time. In fact, uh, it has been reported that uh, the United States, in all innocence, was sharing with China some of their intelligence photographs of uh, the buildup of Russian military forces and telling China, please tell uh, uh, Russia, you know, not to do that. At some point, the Chinese told the Russians, look, this is what the U.S. has been telling us. So there seems to be some difficulty on the part of uh, the new administration in the United States to read the geopolitical realities with the necessary clarity. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us uh, request uh, Dr. John Cherian uh, uh, to address this. Now, Dr. John Cherian, uh, I was wondering, approximately 25 or 26 African countries either abstained or did not vote at the GA. That's a good number of those who wanted to support uh, Russia, so to say. Why? Is it because uh, Russia has sold arms or is it something else? Then another question I have is uh, American pundits have been doing sort of a psychoanalysis of Putin. The guy was, uh, you know, self-isolated for two years and all that. So one doesn't know what he is thinking. Do you think, you know, such uh, American analysis will help America in understanding what Putin might do? And uh, I have one serious doubt. If Putin... Uh, knew that American, or Putin could have anticipated American sanctions, why did he keep so much money in uh, Western banks? Was there any way he could have withdrawn them? And of course, my last question is, uh, has NATO outlived its uh, purpose? Why do we need a NATO? It was established uh, to keep uh, the Soviets out and the Germans down. Now, Soviets are no longer there, and Germany has no intention of militarizing itself with a view to dominate Europe or the world. So, do we need the NATO? Over to you, Dr. Cherian. Thank you, Ambassador Fabian. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this important seminar. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Shankar, and my good friend Anuradha. We have been together in JNU. Yes, um, you know, there has been a lot of pressure from the Americans on countries like India, on African countries, on Latin American countries to line up against Russia after the invasion of Ukraine. But they have not succeeded, especially in Africa. The South African government has uh, issued a very strong statement, uh, not, ex not supporting the Russian uh, actions in Ukraine, but saying that Russia is a friend and we will not take a position against Russia. The only two countries which have played, uh, uh, which are very pro-American on the African continent, uh, is Kenya. The Kenyan uh, ambassador's speech was highlighted in the, ambassador of the UN, his speech was highlighted in the American media. Uh, he compared to uh, uh, he tried to demolish Russia's arguments in Ukraine by saying that uh, even many uh, countries in Africa, uh, which have become independent, have a recent uh, history. So, th so there is no. I mean, that speech of the ambassador, Kenyan ambassador, was highlighted. But a country like Eritrea has openly sided with uh, uh, with the, uh, with, uh, with Russia in the United Nations. Uh, and the African countries are also very unhappy about the way in which the, the African students and Africans working in Ukraine were treated. The president of uh, Nigeria, uh, Mohamed Buhari, 
In fact, uh, although he supported the Americans in the United Nations uh, in the General Assembly, but he made a very strong statement condemning the uh, racist attitude of the Ukrainian authorities towards the uh, towards the, um, uh, the uh, towards African students. Uh, in, the whole immigration policy of uh, you see the double standards of the immigration policies of the European countries. A country like Poland and Hungary, we had closed its doors to uh, you know refugees from Syria, from Iraq, all due to the refugees and the, the refugee situation was created because of the wars America had unleashed in the region. But here, you know, if you have blue eyes and blonde uh, hair, uh, you, know, uh, you know, double standard is uh, visible. In there. So in Africa, uh, barring a very few countries, um, the support for America is sort of muted. And Africans, of course, remember the role uh, Russia played in, in the decolonization struggle. Uh, and now that the South Africa, in South Africa, many people have openly said that America supported the apartheid regime almost till, it's, uh, till the very end. It's only uh, Russia and, of course, uh, Cuba and other and the socialist countries which helped them gain independence. So that you know that that residue of support, the goodwill for Russia is there. The goodwill for Russia, for that matter, uh, you know, as Ambassador, uh, uh, the previous speaker said. Uh, even in Asia, um, you know, people, uh, countries have preferred to remain uh, neutral. And some countries are openly, uh, you know, pro-Russian, like the Vietnamese are. And uh, the, uh, of the, you know, the, the, the junta in Myanmar, for obvious reasons, is openly supporting uh, uh, the Russians. Uh, Latin America is very interesting. Mexico which is uh, America's immediate neighbor, has refused to impose any sanctions on, uh, on, uh, on Russia, despite immense pressure from, uh, from the Americans. Uh, similarly, Brazil, which is ruled by a right-wing uh, president, one expected him, he was a great friend, Bolsonaro, President Bolsonaro was a great friend of uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, people expected him to, you know, support uh, Washington. Uh, he, he's no great friend of, uh, he, he's so anti-communist, anti-socialist. So people expected support from uh, Brazil. That also has not happened. And uh, Venezuela and Cuba have been uh, 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 virtual allies of Russia. So, yes. So, uh, uh, diplomatically, the Americans are not uh, gained, but only the whole of Europe and uh, Western Europe and uh, uh, Canada as, and Japan, uh, the five eyes in Australia, New Zealand, Canada. I mean, they are all fully supporting what's happening in, uh, I mean, the position America is taking. And uh, as you mentioned, the, about the relevance of NATO. I think the whole uh, crisis, I mean, the roots of this crisis is in the expansion of uh, NATO. Uh, you know, the Western government and the Western media are saying that uh, uh, that Russia, you know, launched an unprovoked war in Ukraine. I don't think that's, uh, you know, that's the correct, uh, you know, uh, perception because uh, as this crisis has been in the making since 2000. Eight, the NATO declaration in 2008, when they said they would uh, uh, include uh, Ukraine and Georgia. And then it got further accentuated uh, after the 2014 Euro Maidan coup, uh, you know, coup which was, uh, which in which the Americans had a big role to play, uh, the Obama administration, uh, the, the National Endowment of Democracy. Which the American government had said, well, you know, funneling, uh, you know, the money to the uh, anti Russian groups who saved the coup. And after all, it was a democratically elected government, all said and done, which was overthrown in that uh, constitutional coup. Uh, I mean, the parliament was, uh, you know, uh, was overrun by uh, right wing elements 
Uh, and of course, there are a lot of neo-Nazi elements. I mean, that's a that's a that's a fact. Then the, then came the Crimea referendum, and uh, the uh, and then the Donbas, the, the trouble in the Donbas region started. There was a referendum there too, and they opted for uh, autonomy from the Ukrainians, from the central dominant Ukraine, and there was the the, the Minsk agreement. And the Minsk agreement uh, was not adhered to by the Ukrainian government. Zelensky, when he stood for election, he had promised, you, you know, he, he pretended that he, were, that he, was, uh, he was, was for peace. He wanted to reconcile the different factions. Uh, I believe Zelensky got most of his votes from, uh, the, from Eastern Ukraine, the Russian-dominated part. But once in power, I mean, uh, he changed uh, the you know, the Ukrainian constitution. Uh, I think it was changed before he came to power, but he implemented the agenda of the uh, of the Americans in Ukraine. And uh, you know, Putin has been saying for the last uh, two years that joining NATO is a red line for uh, for uh, Russia and. Uh, and the last since December, since the massing of troops uh, around the along the Ukraine border, I mean, the, the Americans had enough time to you know send a message saying that uh, you know uh, they are not opposed to the idea of uh, uh, Ukraine being a neutral country. And the fact of the matter is that although on paper they it is uh, they said that Ukraine will be admitted to NATO. But uh, Germany and France were opposed to Ukraine becoming a, a member of NATO. And there was no chance of uh, Ukraine uh, realistically uh, becoming a NATO member, uh, at least for a decade. So, I mean, what the Americans tell, what they wanted was Ukraine to, the Ukrainians to fight with the Russians, the Ukrainians to die on their behalf and create a crisis uh, in, in Europe. And the argument that, uh, you know, this is the first time that a war is taking place in the heart of Europe, I think, you know, you know that's misleading history. I think it was the Americans who first started a war uh, in the heart of Europe in uh, 1999 when they launched uh, an attack on, uh, on, uh, on uh, Yugoslavia. And, they, and the, you know, the destruction of Yugoslavia and then they were the ones who created uh, Kosovo, the state of Kosovo. There it was. It was Americans. I mean, the Russians say here there's a precedent. You created Kosovo. I mean, we that's so we can create uh, you know, new states. We also can uh, help in the creation of new states. The two the, the, the two new states which Russia has recognized uh, in uh, eastern uh, in, in uh, eastern Ukraine, the Russian speaking part of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, so there is a precedent. And one reason why, uh, you know, the Russia took this military action in Ukraine is to, uh, I think, secure uh, Crimea. Because uh, the kind of arms, the kind of sophisticated arms the, uh, the West was sending into Ukraine, uh, uh, I mean, it was just a matter of time, according to most observers of the region and also according to the Russians, that uh, an attack on the eastern part was imminent. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, then, and then if the eastern part would have been conquered, then Crimea would also have been under threat. And the another reason is that uh, once Crimea became independent, the water supply to Crimea was cut by the uh, by the Ukrainians, and now Russia has liberated those parts of uh, of Ukraine, and uh, that you know now uh, Crimea, as far as uh, water supply issues are concerned, I mean that issue saw. So my, I think that, uh, and most most uh, uh, you know. Russia and uh, watchers also think that the aim of Russia is to, you know, uh, uh, separate the Russian-speaking part, the eastern part, from uh, from Ukraine, 
take you know uh, capture kiev and uh, and try to install a government which will uh, be which will ensure that uh, ukraine remains neutral um but uh, i don't think they will continue uh, they would like to occupy western ukraine because even after world war 2 you know half of ukraine like half of france sided with uh, with the nazis and uh, it took the uh, you know soviet army more than 3 years after world war 2 to to subdue the anti uh, anti communist uh, fighters of ukraine so i don't think um, ukraine, uh, ukraine uh, is going to uh, be the same after this invasion but there are uh, but uh, it, yesterday or the, or the news came that uh, the ukrainian president has said that he is willing to talk about the country being neutral and the russians uh, i think are, are willing to talk to him about that and also the russians also demanding that about the, that the country should be de nazified and demilitarized i don't think that will uh, the ukrainian government will agree to that because uh, uh, you know you can't uh, tell a sovereign government to demilitarize but but uh, it's a fact that there are extreme right wing and extreme nationalism and, ex and nazi elements there who are uh, doing a lot of fighting in uh, against the russians and uh, that is a, i mean that is a condition which the russians have put on the uh on the ukrainian government so let us hope that uh, you know at 11th hour there can be a breakthrough but i have my uh, serious doubts about that uh, then uh, Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, that's all. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. John Cherian, uh, for uh, that very comprehensive account of uh, what is happening, and uh, you know, and what we can expect. Uh, uh, though, you know. nobody knows what is going to happen tomorrow well ladies and gentlemen uh, we have heard our uh, distinguished panelists uh, they have explained many things but uh, at the same time i see that uh, there are a number of questions which uh, you have raised and uh, in the iic the q and a is the most important part of the program so i'm going to read out the questions uh, maybe two or three questions at a time and ask our distinguished panelists to respond now on second i'm getting to that first question is from uh, sayantani gupta jaffa what about the disturbing ethnic crimes by azov brigade a z o v against the russians in east ukraine aided and abetted by american neocons and the military industry complex of the us the role of the cia backing of ukraine for uh, ukraine far right needs to be acknowledged so that is uh, from sayantani the next one is from joya roy Islamic scholar well scholars point to Israel's role in this conflict motivated by a long term strategy to cut off russian oil and gas from eu and uh, supplementing that supply to the eu from its own new vast reserves in the golan heights also illegally occupied territories now i am going to stop with the third question and uh, this is uh, let me find out who has asked this question um, 
marketing it is Sharvi Sharma. Uh, dear panelists, as we know, Russia is among P5 members, country, member countries, and has a veto powers, so the efforts of UNSC would be vague. But uh, what opinions are available with UN options are available with UNSC to maintain peace between Russia and Ukraine? If this matter is not uh, in the hands of UNSC, then how UNSC can treat countries differently? What is the mechanism to regulate P5 member countries in order to maintain world peace? So I'll stop there for the time being. Let me request uh, uh, Professor Anuradha to start uh, giving her comments. Okay. As far as far uh, as war crimes uh, by the Azov Brigade in uh, East, uh, Eastern Ukraine, I think uh, Russia did uh, raise this issue since quite a while. And they said that in Eastern Ukraine, the civil war uh, linked to secession, the pro-Russian secessionists of the Russian ethnic minority, they had actually seen in Donetsk and Luhansk. They were using the Russian ruble. They had de declared autonomy. And in fact, that was a reason for the Minsk uh, 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 protocols in 2014. And one of the reasons given by Russia was of intervention was that uh, the, Ukraine, uh, the Russian ethnic minorities' rights were being violated. 17,000 of them had been killed in the last seven years. And the EU had not sent its uh, you know, various human rights commissions to look into it. And Ukraine was denying any responsibility towards ethnic Russian minorities. So it was in fact one of the reasons for Russian uh, intervention, which I mentioned. Second, about Israel's role. I think there's an ambiguity in, in that. In fact, Israel blocked some of the weapons going into Ukraine. So they've also taken a nuanced position. They have not gone with their usual position of completely backing uh, the uh, American. Please note the uh, Israeli position because Israel has been building ties with Russia. So their position has been more nuanced this time than uh, earlier. Third, about the Security uh, Council and Russia's veto. Yes, uh, Russia has a veto, China has a veto, the US has a veto, and that is why resolutions do not go against the Security Council. And the Security Council has a very limited role in what they can do, because ultimately, after the UN accepted the Minsk Accord, but the Security Council did not implement those uh, accords. So the Security Council is a political body, and that is why India and others are arguing for it to be democratized, expanded to reflect uh, the current realities. Thanks. These are my three questions and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anuratha. Let us now request Ambassador Mira Shankar. You're on mute, uh, Ambassador. Um, there's some construction going on on top, so I knew <laughs> it to not hammer away while others are speaking. Um, I agree with what Professor Anuradha has said. Uh, clearly, there was a systematic violation of the rights of Russian ethnic minorities in eastern Ukraine um, by the Ukrainian government, also um, you know, denying them the right to use their own language uh, in the area. And that was one of the reasons cited by uh, Putin for his intervention in 2014 in defense of the rights of the ethnic minority, Russian ethnic minorities in Ukraine, uh, who had declared um, you know, separatist uh, republics. Uh, the uh, question of Israel, yes, Israel has adopted a far more nuanced position with regard to this, it's not been openly uh, condemning Russia and Russia's actions, and in fact, has come under some US pressure on this account. So uh, Israel's position is more nuanced in this crisis than it has been. And with regard to the UN Security Council, the veto has been one of the issues 
uh, which has troubled people quite a bit, because it means that unless there is a consensus amongst the, um, you know, uh, permanent members of the Security Council, uh, the UN Security Council gets paralyzed because one or the other uh, permanent member can veto any resolution, even if there is a majority because they have the veto. When India, Germany, Brazil, and Japan had moved their proposal for a reform of the UN Security Council expansion in both the permanent membership as well as the non-permanent membership, they had agreed actually that they would not insist on the right to veto and had also proposed that the right to veto of the P5 should be subjected to a review. Uh, of course, the proposal didn't go anywhere. But now, you know, again, when Russia has used its veto, you're hearing, you know, efforts from the West to say that, um, you know, the uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, resolutions uh, should not be subject to the veto. And perhaps we should have an amendment that in such cases, uh, decisions can be taken by majority. So it's pretty self-serving because the US has used the veto umpteen times. Uh, and uh, this time, because it's Russia, which has used it, these proposals are being made. But yes, as a matter of principle, a lot of countries feel that the veto needs to be reviewed in the interest of a more equal, more democratic world order. Thank you, Ambassador Mirashankar. Uh, Dr. John Cherian, would you like to add anything? No, uh, the Azov Brigade was in the forefront uh, during the Maidan Revolution, the, the Orange Revolution. And, uh, and they have been doing much of the fighting uh, along on the Eastern Front against the uh, breakaway uh, republics also. Uh, and they, is, Israel um, uh, is of course very friendly with Russia. And in fact, when, uh, when uh, Ukraine first objected to holding uh, meetings with uh, Russia on uh, Belarusian uh, soil, uh, um, the Russians have suggested Israel as a neutral venue, but Ukraine uh, rejected that, uh, that proposal. Um, but Israel is very happy with what's, what's happening. One of, the Israeli government has appealed uh, to Ukrainian Jews to immediately uh, come and settle down in, in, is, in Israel. So <laughs> it's a win-win situation as far as the Israelis are concerned. As far as the United Nations, UNSC is concerned, I mean, who cares? Nobody, the big powers don't care for UNSC. They were always intervened in the uh, militarily in other countries using the uh, R2P, the right to protect, uh, uh, you know, concept. And Russia is also doing the same. But when Russia does it, the West is saying, no, 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 this can't be done. Well, thank you, Dr. John Chirian. As regards the P5, we all know how it happened. It was the creation of President Roosevelt, who naively thought that four or five armed policemen will be able to keep peace in the global village without realizing that the policemen themselves can be the offenders. And in which case, nothing has been, you know, nothing can be done. Now, I let's move on. I've got uh, an observation from Samrat Ghosh. Uh, I will read it out. It's not a question. With all sorts of sanctions, sanctions announced against Russia at the outset of the conflict has not uh, deterred Russia from continuing its campaign in Ukraine. And today is the 10th day of conflict after the imposition of sanctions. Sanctions are long term, but Ukraine will be, God forbid, decim will be decimated by then. As uh, Kane said once, in the long run, we are all dead. Well, very interesting and a sad observation. Now I move on to a question from uh, one second. These things, you know, 
Julian George Uman. Only wonder why the so-called West had to describe negatively about a Russian invasion for more than a month and falsely prompting full support to the immature administration of Ukraine. Finally, just had to have second thoughts when something actually happened. And now, simply say they will supply weapons to Ukraine people to go fight and die. Again, a very interesting observation. Then Ashok Verma, in the game of geopolitics, where do people who suffer the most stand? Ukraine was at least not sending terrorists to other countries. Then there is one from Sharvi Sharma. Sources are saying that Russia is facing shortage of ammunition. Will other countries provide Russia the necessary raw materials? And uh, then there is one some Samrat Ghosh. Would it not? One second. Would it not have been prudent if instead of imposing outright sanctions against Russia at the outset of the conflict, the threat of imposing sanctions could still have made Russia ponder by playing all the cards at the beginning itself, US, NATO and European Union and their allies have nothing more uh, now to warn Russia of consequences. Now that the Russia knows all that has been announced, there is no more element of surprise left in it because the only step now left is direct confrontation with Russia to stop its campaign in Ukraine and that could plunge the world in darkness forever. Okay, there is one more question which we shall the, uh, deal with that is Julian George Uman is abstaining opposing a point of view he is abstaining not a statement that it does not sound like a good idea so the question is you know what is the real meaning of abstaining um, let me request uh, Ambassador Mira Shankar to handle that what does it mean for a country to abstain when a resolution is uh, being discussed We can't hear you. Sorry. Um, uh, now, can you hear me? Yes, please. Uh, the I said abstention can be interpreted in many ways, you know, but essentially it means that you are adopting a position of neutrality. Otherwise, you would have either voted for the resolution uh, or against it. When you're neither voting against nor for it, it means that your position is somewhat neutral. You don't fully support the resolution nor are you fully against it. Um, quite often, it also means that you don't want to choose. You know, when you have a difficult situation and you don't want to choose in a particular situation, uh, abstention provides a convenient way but if you look at uh, the remarks of many of the countries, I think they have been critical uh, of uh, the violation of territorial integrity and sovereignty. And India also has emphasized that these are fundamental aspects of the UN Charter and must be respected. Many have called for an immediate cessation of violence and a recourse to negotiations and discussions as the way forward. But at the same time, they also have not gone along with the US, the Western sponsored resolutions uh, condemning Russia and uh, basically uh, you know, putting it in a corner. So it's a position which many countries have adopted uh, where uh, they don't necessarily uh, believe that violation of territorial integrity and sovereignty uh, is something to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, lauded. And at the same time, in fact, uh, they feel that it should be respected. But at the same time, they don't want to take sides in a 
in an issue which has a historical context. And this is one point in that historical context. So where the blame lies cannot only be uh, you know, determined at this point of time, then many have good relations with both countries and don't want to offend either partner. So you could interpret abstention essentially as a, a neutral position on the issue, but with nuances which may vary. Thank you, Ambassador Mira Shankar. Now, I have here a question from Garima Raghavanshi. How do you view racism faced by the Africans, Indians and others who are currently stuck in the Ukraine during the war? And why does the West is still showing double standards? Would Dr. John Sherian like to answer that? Okay, I already spoke about that. Um, well, yeah, but he has still asked you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just imagine uh, the the kind of reception the uh, people from uh, the West Asia, from Africa, the, the kind of reception they got. Even today, many of them are uh, languishing in uh, in camps. Um, no chance of uh, uh, citizenship being uh, or residency being given to them. While uh, for as far as Ukrainians are concerned, the European Union has made an announcement a uh, couple of days ago that they will be given almost citizenship like, like uh, rights. For three years, they can uh, stay in, uh, in the EU, work, get housing, get all the benefits which EU citizens have. Can you imagine uh, any refugee from Africa or Asia getting this kind of a privilege? Well, uh, I mean, it is, uh, you know, racism elevated to very, very sophisticated levels. Thank you, Dr. John Charian. In fact, you have answered the second question from Gary Marigavanshi also, so I'm not uh, raising it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have exceeded uh, the time, but we still have a few minutes. Uh, uh, let me request whether the panelists have any final thoughts, uh, 100 seconds each. Uh, Professor Anuradha, to start, please. Uh, no, I think um, ultimately, to suffer, stop, and uh, offer similar views in the global south, similar to a lot of peace movements also, that there should be kind of a common security and not these kind of competitive. And I think India also has learned a lot of lessons, as uh, John and uh, have said, this uh, us versus them, uh, how they're being the kind of racist uh, and realist policies that they've combined, uh, how um, uh, small other states are being in, and being destroyed so thank you uh, a lot of uh, scholars and analysts should uh, really work this. thank you thank you so much uh, ambassador mira shankar please uh, look, i i just want to say that the you know uh, uh, thinkers in America, of course, few of them, and mainly conservative, like Henry Kissinger or Mearsheimer, have all argued that the only way to have a sustainable resolution of the Ukraine crisis is for Ukraine not to join either bloc, neither to become part of Russia, nor to become a part of NATO, but to be neutral and to be a bridge between the two. And they have also argued for greater autonomy to the eastern part of Ukraine, where uh, Russian speaking people are in large numbers. And in fact, the originator of the whole concept of the Cold War or containment of Russia during the Cold War, George Kennan, 
actually not now, but earlier, had argued that this was extremely short-sighted of the US to treat Russia like a defeated country. And he said our quarrel was with the communist ideology, not with Russia or the Russian people. But now we seem to be moving in this direction. So I think there have been serious thinkers in the US who have understood the logic of the situation and how to prevent its destabilization. Uh, so let's hope that at some point, you know, everybody can pull back and maybe adopt more rational positions rather than those animated by old rivalries. Thank you, Ambassador Mirishankar. Uh, Dr. John Cherian? I think uh, that the Americans are hoping that uh, Ukraine is going to be another Afghanistan for the Russians. And uh, this would lead to the breakup of Russia. It was, it was after uh, the uh, Soviet Union's misadventure in Afghanistan that the Soviet Union, uh, one of the factors that led to the breakup of the Soviet Union. So I think the Americans, uh, you know, they're sort of crazed with uh, power. You remember what um, President Biden said at the end of his uh, State of the Union uh, speech? He said, go get, go get him. So I don't know who he was referring to, whether he was referring to Putin or whether he was referring to Trump. <laughs> but most people in the, and, and Senator Lindsey Graham said the only way to solution to this crisis in uh, Ukraine is to assassinate somebody should go and kill Putin. So the Americans, I mean, this, have lost their uh, minds over Ukraine, I think. Thank you, Dr. John Cherian. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to wind up now with your permission. Well, another Security Council meeting is on on monday but uh, we should not expect too much from it that is going to discuss uh, the attack among other things on the nuclear reactor the biggest in europe but uh, reports indicate that uh, there was no attack on the reactor per se it was a training school which was attacked and the reactors are safe and uh, radiation levels are uh, uh, have not gone up uh, now, coming to a neutral Ukraine, um, well, uh, it was mentioned uh, that uh, uh, that Zelensky has uh, mentioned it, but, uh, you know, we have to wait and see because he says so many things. Uh, we have to wait and see. Now, occupation of Ukraine uh, by Russia uh, Allah Afghanistan, well, that is what uh, some people in the West uh, are hoping for, but uh, President uh, Putin is unlikely to oblige them because he may be aggressive, he may be even wicked, you can say, but he's quite intelligent. He learns his lessons. But we are all agreed that it is uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian people who are suffering they are suffering as i can see it because there are three presidents who have collaborated unwittingly to sort of uh, start this war and it seems they are in no hurry to end it now india of course uh, has to navigate through tricky waters but uh, we are confident that uh, Indian diplomacy can do that. Uh, now, Cold War was mentioned. Well, there was no winner in the Cold War. What happened was that uh, one of the parties just disappeared. You know, the Soviet Union just disappeared. It was not that the Soviet Union was defeated. It just dematerialized. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us give a big hand to our distinguished panelists. Uh, Ambassador Mira Shankar, Professor Anuratha, and Dr. John Cherian. We should also thank and give a big hand to IIC's program head, uh, Tete, who is somewhere there in cyberspace, but she chooses to be invisible, and also to uh, 
Sandeep, who brought us all together. He has been working very hard to, you know, to put us together. So thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, Tete. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us and also for all the questions you raised. You can uh, tell your friends that there will be a YouTube where they can hear all this. Thank you. All the best.